Hey Roots family. I'll never forget this one Sunday over a decade ago when we were living in Boston and attending a Baptist church. This church had a sweet middle-aged woman who was the church's children's pastor. And every once in a while, the children's pastor would be invited to preach on a Sunday morning. And it must not have happened a whole lot because I only remember her preaching this this one time in all the years that we attended. And I'll confess, I don't remember the particular text that she was preaching from that Sunday or even the broader point of her sermon. But what I distinctly remember is her emphasizing Jesus' kindness and patience. She said that Jesus was just so loving and kind that he would never get frustrated with us and throw his hands up and say, where is your faith? <laughs> Which made me laugh because I thought to myself, but Jesus does that a lot in the Gospels. <laughs> this memory has always served as a reminder for me of just how easily we can edit out the parts of Jesus' story that make us a little bit uncomfortable. Today's Gospel reading might be one of those stories for some of us. It's the story of Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers in the temple. I'm going to suggest that this story is really challenging for us today in a number of ways. It challenges us to analyze and question the systems that we may have grown accustomed to but may be corrupt. And it challenges us differently depending on our personalities as to how we're going to respond to our calling to be truth tellers. And as Jesus always does, it reveals to us an aspect of God's faithful character and passionate love. But before we dive into the text this week, let's pray for the Spirit's work of illumination. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you are the one who reveals, convicts, comforts. We invite you to move in us in a way only you can. You know our lives, our hearts, our dreams, and our sorrows better than anyone. May the word be like a seed that finds good soil this morning. May it take root, may it bear fruit, good fruit, fruit that will last. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. If you have your own translation of the New Testament, you're welcome to turn in it to John chapter 2, or you can follow along with me. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, starting in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In some traditions, after the scripture is read, the reader will say, the word of the Lord, and the congregation will say in response, thanks be to God. So sometimes you might hear me say, the word of the Lord, after the scripture reading, and if you feel comfortable, go ahead and say, thanks be to God. You wanna try? The word of the Lord. <laughs> now, as most of you are probably already aware, last Sunday evening, our middle son was feeling particularly fatigued and was experiencing some abdominal pain. And since he'd been having stomach problems last week as well, and since he'd been fatigued a lot lately, Oshida had already made him a doctor's appointment. But that was for Monday. But now it was seeming like the fatigue and the pain was getting worse. When Oshida ran these symptoms by our dear sister Kirsten, who is a doctor and also on the Roots leadership team, she urged us to go ahead and take him into the hospital immediately and not to wait around till Monday. So we took him in and they tested his blood and pretty quickly determined that he had a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. 
Suddenly, it was like all three of us were pushed onto a conveyor belt uh, that was already moving very quickly. Uh, we were told that he would need to be admitted and monitored for several days, and that all three of us would need to have an education about how we'd be now managing his diabetes for the rest of his life. And it really felt quite overwhelming. And that's why I, I especially want to thank all of you for how supportive you've been. Uh, it means so much to us. We knew that you guys were thinking about us. We knew that you were praying for us. And we really appreciate how um, you thought about helping us with meals uh, while we were still reeling from all this. So uh, the truth is, this past week was really overwhelming and like a whirlwind. And I'm not sure how we could have gotten through it without your support. So thank you all so much. As we were there in the hospital meeting with lots and lots of doctors, um, we were also learning a ton about diabetes and health insurance and prescriptions. And one of the doctors that we met was an endocrinologist, a specialist in conditions like diabetes. And it was dawning on me that insulin is the substance that is life or death for people with type 1 diabetes. And yet, there are systems and structures that stand in between this substance and those who desperately need it. And some of the entities that stand in between this life and death substance and the people who need it have a profit motive. When you really think about that, how messed up is that? So I asked the doctor, what about people who need insulin to live, but who don't have easy access to it or can't afford it? And she stoically said to me, they die. It happens all the time. Let that sink in for a moment, that in our world today, in the 21st century, there is a substance that millions of people need every day to live. And there are corporations who mediate the distribution of that substance to those people, and those corporations have a motive to make money for their shareholders to compete with other corporations. It's stuff like that that'll make you want to flip some tables. One of the things that this passage shows us is that Jesus had a critical eye towards the impact of the structures of everyday life on the most vulnerable people in society. It may not be entirely clear from John's account of this event, but this temple protest by Jesus is one of the episodes in his life that is attested to by all four of the Gospels, and each one gives us slightly more context and insight into what's going on here. For example, in Matthew's account, Jesus says, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, these are references to Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7, respectively. And trust me when I tell you that the religious stewards of the temple did not want a popular prophet like Jesus shouting quotations at them from Jeremiah 7. <laughs> In the verses immediately preceding that reference in Jeremiah 7, the prophet not only accuses Judah of following other gods, but he also accuses Judah of oppressing immigrants, orphans, and widows, and even shedding innocent blood. Quoting Jeremiah 7, especially the part about turning the house that bears God's name into a den of robbers, was a direct indictment of corruption and unfaithfulness. For Jesus and his Judean contemporaries, the religious system of his day was inextricably linked to the economic system. They weren't separated like they are for us today. They were very much entangled. For example, in the first century, the temple would have also served as a type of bank with safe deposit boxes and also as a type of customs where you'd exchange foreign and local currency into a type of currency that could be used to buy animals for sacrifice. So Jesus wasn't only accusing the religious leaders of corrupt worship practices, he was also accusing them of corrupt economic practices. In fact, we shouldn't think of this episode like Jesus barging into a church service and shouting at the preacher. The part of the temple where this took place was the outer court that functioned more like a public meeting area for all kinds of people. As we're learning to follow in the way of Jesus, we are learning how to see the world the way Jesus sees it. We're learning to view the world through lenses 
that are critical of structures in society that would seek to exploit or abuse the vulnerable. This is one of the acute ways that this story challenges those of us who are less inclined to be confrontational. Living here in Minnesota for the last several years, I know this is a real thing. There is a way that some of us are culturally conditioned to want to avoid conflict. We're sort of taught that going along to get along is how we keep the peace. But Jesus doesn't call us to be peacekeepers. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. And there's an important distinction here. This is how Oshida put it once. She said, peacekeeping maintains the unjust status quo by preferring the powerful. Peacemaking flips over a few tables and breaks out a whip when the poor are exploited. Peacekeeping does everything to secure a place at the table. Peacemaking says all are welcome to the table, then extends the table with leaves of inclusive love. Fear drives peacekeeping. Love powers peacemaking. So it's important that those of us who are more inclined to avoid conflict recognize that our call to be peacemakers critically entails the call to be truth tellers. And when we speak truth to power, the powers aren't going to like it very much. Like they did with Jesus, they may seek to discredit us, to silence us, or even destroy us. And that is why it's so important for the church to model a healthy alternative to the world around us. We aren't called to be the kind of community that silences dissent or hides the truth. Our witness is irreparably damaged when we do those kind of things, as we've seen with scandal after scandal in the church in America. This week I was listening to an interview with New Testament scholar and professor Scott McKnight on his new book, A Church Called Tov. Tov is a Hebrew word that means good. He co-authored this book with his daughter, who with him were members of Willow Creek Church when that church was shown to have covered up the abuses of its pastor. And one of the things that he said that stuck out to me was, he said that Willow Creek copied some of their cover-up tactics from the corporate world. And this stuck out to me because of how much I believe that the church is called to be an altogether different kind of organization. We aren't called to be like a corporation. We're called to model the kind of human relationships that are envisioned by the prophets in the new creation. We're called to be a new way of being human community together. One that is radically committed to the truth and radically committed to loving and honoring one another. Oshida and I aren't perfect people, but we're people who have been a part of enough churches to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've been part of churches where the fellowship was wonderful and it was like a glimpse of heaven. We've felt supported and encouraged and inspired, even sent out by churches. But we've also been a part of churches that were unhealthy, churches that didn't want to talk about racism or economic injustice and would try to silence us if we tried to speak out on those issues. We've been a part of churches that had unhealthy leaders who tried to use their power to ostracize people in the church, even us. And that's why we've resolved to create a different kind of culture in the churches that we lead. Together with the leadership team, we will ensure that Roots has a Tov culture, a culture that promotes healing and wholeness. The Jesus way demands nothing less. The Jesus way that we're learning not only challenges us to speak truth to power, but it also challenges us to guard ourselves against self-righteousness. When we read the story of Jesus' temple protest, for those of us who are more inclined to be confrontational, we can all too easily place ourselves in the Jesus role of the story. We can be too quick to make the tables that we're opposed to the same tables that Jesus opposes. And this can be a danger because we aren't always aware of our own blind spots. We can be too narrowly perceiving the landscape from a particular social location. And if we're not careful, a text like this could be weaponized to justify any and all sorts of disruptive, challenging, even violent behavior. Even those who hold all the power in society can sometimes point to this passage as they flip the tables of those who have less power than them. 
So it's important to say that all tables are not the same. Jesus' table flipping doesn't go in both directions. It only goes in one direction, to the defense of those who are most susceptible to exploitation. Jesus' table flipping isn't for both sides. It's only for one side. And he made this clear in his inaugural sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said he hasn't come for those who think they are well, those who are super religious, or those who are content to use their power to oppress others. No, Jesus has come for those who are unwell, those who are stigmatized as sinners, and those who are beaten down by systems of oppression. We who are more inclined to speak out prophetically would do well to temper that zeal with some wisdom. When we read a passage like this one, we shouldn't immediately place ourselves in Jesus' role of prophet. We are more like the disciples, watching Jesus' protest and trying to understand it. They had to discern what Jesus was up to by using the scriptures they knew. When we approach Jesus' prophetic temple protest as a community, seeking to understand it together, we are better able to avoid a self-righteous martyr complex. Instead of thinking we're all alone like Elijah did, we recognize that God has thousands of others who have not bent their knee to false gods. This gospel reading comes to us at a time when there are grave injustices in the world which demand confrontation from the followers of the original table flipper. We're also in a time when a lot of people are claiming to be righteously flipping tables. Not all those claims are equally valid. We need discernment and the wisdom that comes from healthy community to know the difference. As a community, let us be a discerning, table-flipping, truth-telling, prophetic witness that nurtures an alternative culture of honoring one another and healing. Amen.